In this video, I'm going to cover the paranormal events that have occurred on the property of Skinwalker Ranch. I'm going to give you my hypothesis as to what it is that is manifesting on that ranch, as well as what the objective is of such phenomenon. In 1998, billionaire mogul Robert Bigelow purchased the 480 acre property otherwise known as Skinwalker Ranch. He purchased this property for the sole purpose of studying UFO activity as well as general paranormal activity. He employed three scientists to study the phenomenon and regularly visit the ranch for lengthy and extensive investigations. They were highly qualified scientists comprising of a veterinarian, a physicist, and a biochemist. Bigelow also put together a multidisciplinary advisory board filled with people who are experts at mainstream science to examine and study the findings that the three PhDs would attain during their investigation on the Skinwalker Ranch. To give you an idea of what kind of paranormal events occurred on the Skinwalker Ranch, as well as Dulce, New Mexico, which the uh, team under Bigelow also went to to study paranormal activity and UFOs, I'm gonna give you a few examples, but I must tell you, these are a very small number of examples. Every single paranormal manifestation that you could ever hope to come up with manifested itself on Sk at Skinwalker Ranch. But before we begin, I just want to show you this really, really cool shirt I'm wearing. It's called UFO Gun Camera Footage, and buying one helps support this channel. If you're interested, uh, the link's below in the description, and uh, people are probably going to give you a lot of double takes if they're interested in UFOs if you wear this shirt. Let's continue. The first paranormal event that I want to share with you that occurred on Skinwalker Ranch was when Tom Gorman, and that's not his real name, they don't use the real names to protect their privacy, they are a former owner of the ranch, he saw a giant wolf far away coming towards him. And it got closer and closer, and it was a bizarrely large uh, wolf. Tom's father, who's six feet tall, the wolf came up to the man's chest. It's just... Nothing is natural about this, totally bizarre. The wolf had these hypnotic light blue eyes that just didn't seem that like they should be that color. And, it had, and the wolf was bizarrely tame. Even if it was someone's pet and they domesticated the wolf, it should never have been this tame among strangers. The whole thing was just totally bizarre. Then suddenly out of nowhere, the wolf <clears throat> darted toward the corral where one of Tom's uh, prized calves had its head sticking through the bars and the wolf chomped down on the calf's head and tried to pull it through the bars. In response, Tom and his father went over to beat the wolf. One of them was kicking it, another one was beating it with a baseball bat, and the wolf was showing no expression of suffering, wasn't slowing down, was continuing to try to get the calf out of the corral. Tom yelled at his son to go get his 357 out of the truck. His son got the 357 handgun, got it to Tom. Tom shot two shots into the wolf and it showed absolutely no response. It didn't show any concern, no suffering, no, it didn't, didn't make any noises, nothing. Finally, Tom shot a third point blank range 357 caliber into the wolf and reluctantly it started to release its mouth from the calf. Tom noted that at that range and at that caliber, the wolf should have died or at least been severely injured and it was neither of the above. After all that, the hypnotic blue eyes of the wolf looked directly into Tom's eyes. Tom shot the wolf again with his 357, and it showed absolutely no distress. At this point, the wolf was about 30 feet away and retreating very slowly. Tom then yelled to his son to get a high power rifle out of his truck. His son went, retrieved the high power rifle, gave it to Tom. And Tom shot the wolf a couple more times. To make a longer story short, they pursued the wolf following its tracks and the wolf seemingly disappeared. There were numerous cattle mutilations on the property that weren't done by scavengers or predators because scientists know what it looks like when a scavenger or predator uh, attacks an animal. Instead, what it showed in the aftermath was 
cuttings that were so precise that only a skilled surgeon would be capable of doing it and that surgeon would have to utilize a scalpel or a knife. There was one incident in which Tom's son, Tad, uh, saw a small calf, had to go somewhere else for 20 minutes, came back, and the, ca and the calf was mutilated within that 20 minute period. There is no blood at all. There is no tra animal tracks. There is nothing that usually would be showcased if the animal was attacked by a scavenger or a predator. There was an immense amount of trickery that occurred within the house on the Skinwalker Ranch and outside of the house. To give an example, once Ellen, Tom Gorman's wife, bought cereal, and when she was ready to eat the cereal with her children, they couldn't find the cereal. It ended up being in the freezer. No one knows how it got there. Another very common occurrence in their house is that the salt would all of a sudden be in the pepper shaker and the pepper would be in the salt shaker. On several occasions, uh, Tom's wife, Ellen, would get ready to take a shower and she would put her towel and brush on the counter right before taking a shower. She'd get out of the shower when she was done and the towel and brush would be nowhere to be found. Stuff like this happened over and over and over again. So whatever this phenomenon is, it didn't just manifest itself outside of the confines of their home, but it was happening within their home as well. Of all the extraordinary things that occurred at Skinwalker Ranch, the most common was these orange structures that would appear over the, over the cottonwood trees about a mile away from the home of the Gormans. In one particular evening, Tom recounts that he saw one of these very common orange structures appear, but as he looked at the orange structure and it was nighttime, he could see what appeared to be a blue sky in the structure and it appeared to be daytime in the structure. He theorized after seeing that, that these orange structures may be some kind of portals into another realm and whatever is manifesting on the property is coming through those portals from other dimensions. On another occasion, Tom saw an orange structure appear at night and he saw a black triangle UFO come through that orange structure and exit it. Amazingly, one of the scientists working under Robert Bigelow uh, the organization, by the way, is that they were working under, or what it was called, was NIDS, National Institute of Discovery Science, run by Robert Bigelow. Anyways, the scientist was on the property. He was looking at a tree through, through uh, night vision binoculars. All of a sudden, he sees this giant, I don't know, figure or beast in the tree. And it was so big, it was blocking out the stars. And then all of a sudden, this beast or figure overtook the scientist's mind and he said that telepathically he received the message, we are watching you. And he relayed that when that happened, it was if his mind was taken over. In one incident, Jim, I don't think it's his real name, but he was the most experienced investigator on the team of scientists that was at the ranch studying the phenomenon. And he saw this tunnel start to open up. It was about two feet off the ground. It was a dirty yellow color and the tunnel started expanding more and more. And he said that he noticed a black creature crawl out of the tunnel and exit the tunnel. Oh, and it should be noted that in the aforementioned incident that Jim went into a field to meditate prior to the incident of the tunnel opening up and the creature coming out of it, Jim believed that meditation can sometimes elicit the phenomenon. As the events at Skinwalker Ranch began to be covered in the news and people were discovering what was taking place there, he was getting visitors, the owner. And there was one incident where this six foot two blonde man drove a long distance all the way to Skinwalker Ranch and begged and pleaded with Tom Gorman to come onto his property just so that he could meditate. Tom Gorman ultimately gave in. The man was led onto the ranch, picked a little place in a pasture to meditate, and he stood there standing in some kind of standing meditation, 
and moments later, Tom Gorman and his son could hear cowbells, but there were no cowbells on the property. And then they saw this creature doing a beeline for the meditator, and the way this creature was described, it was like predator. You could kind of see it, but you kind of couldn't. Like, it was like an outline. So it makes a beeline to the meditator, and it belches out this roar that is half that sounded half between the roar of a lion and the roar of a bear. Interestingly enough, after the predator-like creature belched out that roar, as soon as the creature was done doing that, it beelined in the opposite direction as fast as it went towards the meditator. And unsurprisingly, the meditator was freaked out, was going hysterical, he left the land, I would assume never ever to go return to the Skinwalker Ranch again. A really fascinating incident happened on the Skinwalker Ranch. A blue orb came towards Tom Gorman and his wife Ellen Gorman. And what makes this incident so interesting is this blue orb initiated in them an artificial fear, an overwhelming, profound, intense fear that cannot be explained. Somehow that blue orb was able to artificially elicit a absurd amount of fear in both Tom and his wife. In other words, it was manipulating the emotions in them because even though it would be frightful to see a blue orb, the fear that they were experiencing is in no way, shape, or form proportionate to the natural fear that would arise if you did see a blue orb floating around you. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of my hypothesis regarding this phenomenon. And this whole video, of course, is based upon the book, The Hunt for Skinwalker. I highly recommend it, link below. As I was reading it, there was a pattern of behavior from the phenomenon that continuously arose without failure. And that is, to me, it was very clear that the, that the phenomenon is trying to get a rise out of people, trying to create fear and emotions and anxiety and these kind of feelings. For example, the wolf that was basically bulletproof, it, uh, it caused havoc in the minds of the Gormans. How about the orb that Ellen and Tom Gorman confronted that artificially made them feel profound amounts of fear? How about all the trickery that was committed by this phenomenon in the house? For example, the salt shaker would suddenly have pepper and the pepper would suddenly have salt and that would switch back and forth during their stay on the ranch. What about the cattle mutilations? Not only would the cattle mutilations cause fear in the animals, and this phenomenon did cause fear in the animals very regularly, but it would also have a byproduct of causing anxiety and sadness because those cows are worth a lot of money. It's part of the livelihood of a rancher and so forth. So it was like a symbiotic relationship. The animals get fear, fear and anxiety, and, and likewise, the human beings get it from the destruction of the animals as well. I didn't mention it, but uh, th I think it was three of Tom Gorman's dogs were incinerated by this phenomenon. So it's as clear as day that this phenomenon objective seems to be to create emotional outbursts from animals and human beings. So my hypothesis is that somehow this interdimensional, these beings or this force um, somehow derives either fulfillment or nourishment from the emotions of animals and people, perhaps in the same way that plants turn sun into photosynthesis and are nourished from the sun. But I also believe that this phenomenon is extremely intelligent, extraordinarily intelligent. It is creating a balance to fulfill its objective. In other words, um, why is this phenomenon relegated to rural areas and it seemingly always need, seems to be near um, native people for some bizarre reason that could be coincidental? But I think the underpinning here is that this phenomenon likes to be in rural areas that are not heavily populated. And I think it's because this phenomenon needs to create a precise balance to attain what it seeks. If this phenomenon was widespread all over the world, 
Well, guess what? Everyone would get used to it. We'd acclimate to it. And humanity would not have this kind of response that we currently do have since it's rare and since it's relegated only to certain places in the world. This is also why I believe that this phenomenon almost never kills human beings. When it has demonstrated over and over again that it, without question, has the capabilities to take people out, but it never does. I believe the reason for this is primarily because it doesn't want to draw attention to itself. Imagine if this phenomenon started taking people out. Well, guess what? If that was to occur, then you would get much more scientific interest uh, out of sheer necessity and science would be all over this phenomenon because people are dying from it. This phenomenon simply does not want that kind of attention. It has created a very precise balance throughout the world so that it can attain precisely what it seeks. Too much attention, it's not gonna get what it wants. Too little attention, it won't get it what it wants. It's constantly weighing that balance and ensuring that balance is maintained. Interestingly, Tom Gorman, the former owner of the ranch, tried to tell the NIDS group when they were about to study his ranch that you should, first of all, your command post should not be very close to the ranch and you should sneak onto the ranch sur surreptitiously and do it in a way in which you cause the least amount of attention to yourself and don't bring so much technology and recording devices onto the ranch because if you do that, the phenomenon will retreat. And Tom Gorman was actually correct on this. As soon as NIDS got onto the property, with all their technology and so forth, the phenomenon started to dissipate rapidly and never was the way it manifested prior to NIDS getting onto the property. Another reason I believe this is the case is not only because the NIDS group was very boisterous with all their technology and didn't hunt this phenomenon like a wild animal, which is what Tom Gorman recommended, but also the attitude of the scientists, very neutral, very cold, very aggressive. That's the antithesis of what the phenomenon wants. The phenomenon wants people to be scared out of their mind. The phenomenon wants strong emotions to arise because that is how it feeds itself in some way. And by the time NIDS got onto the property, um, Tom Gorman has already sold the property and the only reason he was also on the property with NIDS is because NIDS actually hired Tom Gorman to help them to investigate uh, the paranormal phenomenon that was taking place. So the wife and the, and the, and the children weren't there and so <clears throat> mostly it was just the scientists and the scientists were not getting as scared because they were essentially getting paid to be aggressive and to learn about the phenomenon. Another reason I believe that the NIDS group arrival at the ranch led to a quick dissipation of the phenomenon is because I don't think the phenomenon wants society to have any scientific grasp or understanding of it. The phenomenon does not want anything recorded of it. It does not want us to get even 1% more intimate with understanding what it is and how it works. And the reason for this is very simplistic. The more we understand the phenomenon on a scientific level, the less mysterious it is and the less scary it is. That's just the way it works. The more you know about something, the, le the more you take away that mystery, the less you're going to have fear and anxiety over it. The last thing this phenomenon wants is for the world population to better grasp it and then laugh at it or think, ah, it's no big deal. No, see, the phenomenon is literally maintaining a homeostasis upon the entire planet. And it's a mistake, in my opinion, to view the phenomenon as uh, a conniving, you know, let's get these humans. No, the phenomenon should be looked at like a wild animal. It's a part of nature. In fact, I don't like the word supernatural. I don't like that word at all because nothing is supernatural. Everything is natural. This phenomenon, which I believe in this instance is interdimensional and it may be some sort of force or it may even be beings 
spiritual beings of some sort from other dimensions. Regardless, it is doing what it does in the same way a lion does in the grasslands of Africa. It's surviving. It's a part of nature. You know, we humans, we like to project our own perception of things. Oh, it's so exotic and mysterious. It's interdimensional. No, 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 no. It's no different than a rodent. It's no different than a kangaroo. It's no different than a fish in the sea. It's a part of nature. It's just nature manifesting in a way that we don't have a lot of understanding of, but there's nothing spectac any more spectacular about this phenomenon than a tropical fish swimming in the ocean. It's trying to survive like animals try to survive and like we try to survive. It just so happens that this level of existence, these beings thrive off of the emotions of humans and animals. There was a lot more I wanted to talk about, but this video is getting very long, so I'm, I'm gonna cut it here. But I will say this, uh, I, I, I have this weird respect for the phenomenon in a sense, in the same way that I have respect for a lion that devours a gazelle. Is the lion evil for devouring the gazelle? No, the lion is surviving the way it knows how. So when this, when this phenomenon manifests and it does all these things that we perceive as evil in reality the phenomenon is doing nothing more than survival like the lion in the grasslands of africa that being said i would not want to have to contend with this phenomenon that is for sure but there's something very interesting when you read the book that you may have noticed in two incidences there was a meditator and it seemed like the phenomenon does not like meditation um, and why I'm laughing because I'm like, is it going to do something to me because I brought up the antidote to the phenomenon? No, it's not. I'm UFO Jesus. No one messes with UFO Jesus. So let me continue. There was an incident where I, I spoke about the blonde haired man, 6'2". He went out to the ranch to do a, medita a standing meditation and he did the standing meditation and then some weird predator like kind of see-through creature ran up to the man and screamed in the man's face. There was another incident where there was meditation. It was one of the scientists, they gave him the name Jim. He did a meditation and shortly after, a portal opened and a weird creature um, uh, crawled out of the portal. So here is my hypothesis. One of the greatest enemies to this interdimensional manifestation is meditation. If I had poltergeists, God forbid, but if I did have poltergeists in my apartment, you better believe I'd become a goddamn monk. I'd be meditating all day. I, I am a meditator, by the way. I do meditate on a daily basis, but I would up it, man. I'd be doing like an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. I'd be like a Buddhist monk. And, uh, and the reason I would do that, and I don't, look, I don't know if this would work. This is a hypothesis. So if you have a poltergeist, don't rely on my advice. I, might get you in trouble. But I'm just saying I would experiment with that because <clears throat> meditation is a way to get equilibrium of the mind. Uh, they've done countless studies that show that it, regular meditators, the parts of their brains that are associated with sadness and anxiety and depression uh, shrinks and the parts of the brain that are associated with inner peace and stability gets larger and so forth. So, I hypothesize that uh, if you do have a poltergeist or you have a property that's having a lot of weird phenomenon, get a bunch of people, potentially it could backfire. This is just a hypothesis. This is just for informational purposes only. Uh, but theoretically, you could get a bunch of people to meditate on that property, to meditate a lot. That will scare the living daylights out of the phenomenon because you're doing the antithesis of what it wants, which is to get a rise out of human beings. And so I think the phenomenon would, uh, would perceive meditation and many people meditating the same way a, a lion would perceive a region of the woodlands that has no prey. Nobody wants to starve. And the quickest way to starve this interdimensional phenomenon, which seemingly thrives on getting a rise out of people, is to meditate and create that equilibrium so there is nothing, there is, you, you create 
a, a famine for the phenomenon. There's nothing to feast upon. As far as how these interdimensional revelations are going to impact disclosure and our world, well, it's going to change the entire landscape of science. This new reality is going to have to become accepted. I believe there are pockets within our government that have a much greater grasp and understanding of this phenomenon, and that when we have disclosure of the interplanetary physical civilizations that are visiting our Earth, it's inevitable that it's going to be accompanied by more or the beginning of revelations about the interdimensional reality that is also present on our planet. To change the landscape of science so dramatically is going to trickle down into every arena of life. It's going to be an evolution of, of every fathomable kind for humankind. It's going to be a consciousness evolution. It's going to be a spiritual evolution. It's going to be everything you can imagine because you cannot change science on such a fundamental level you know, letting us all know that not only are we being visited by other civilization, but there's an ever-present interdimensional presence on our planet as well. You can't bring that into reality, into the human consciousness, and prove that it exists without a cascading effect to impact every other aspect of human living, psychology, and day-to-day -day existence. <laughs> there was a lot more I wanted to say, a lot more insights, a lot more theories and hypotheses. But we're gonna cut it there because we're getting beyond 20 minutes. Maybe I'll talk about the, uh, the ranch at a future time because it is incredibly fascinating. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you will subscribe because there's gonna be so much more content like this. I have a Patreon account and I also, like I said, I have this amazing t-shirt, link below in the description, a great way to support this channel. I will see you in the next, next, next episode. episode. episode.